So um, initially I was uh, planning on working on Wittgenstein's forms of life or form of life, if you prefer. Um, throughout my uh, exposure of primary and secondary literature, I would definitely have to defer to form of life as a singular term. And I'll also attempt to justify this to some extent. So um, here there might be some sort of uh, arguments that are not necessarily sequentially related to each other, again, given that this was intended to be a broader project and it was later on condensed as a paper. Uh, the vast majority of the literature, at least to my exposure of Wittgenstein's notion of form of life, has been in regards to a debate between monism and pluralism on one hand, and naturalism and transcendentalism on the other. There's work such as von Compagni's that kind of try to enunciate the combinatorial possibilities of such positions. Uh, secondly, I, should, uh, I shall also look at Peter Hacker's view of the autonomy of grammar and provide a complementary explanation to what I thought, at least to, to that uh, extent that uh, it, it could provide not only a clear understanding of what it means to have a norm of representation and the process following a, a rule, but also if perhaps there is some sort of normative component to this. And I'm also quite aware that the, the majority of Wittgensteinians are non-cognitivists when it comes to uh, Wittgenstein's action theory or position on ethics. So to that extent, I know this position would have been uh, a minority position. And lastly, um, I um, also wanted to contextualize Wittgenstein's view of form of life as a religious notion, particularly in the space of religious epistemology. Uh, so firstly, to begin with this discussion of monism and pluralism, is there a single human for, uh, form of life which is internal function to our biological aggregate, or are there many forms of life which differ from one culture to another? And um, on the other hand, I would also like to kind of explain that the transcendentalists seem to hold this position that forms of life are an innate idea sui generis with its own unique bounds of semantic assessment and assertability. The naturalists, however, on the other hand, seem to frame the debate as strictly within empirical explanations, namely anything that could be conceived and explained uh, via linguistic mechanisms about the form of life have to be somehow restricted to empirical investigation. So the central argument that, that I attempt to defend is that uh, the clearest way and perhaps the most persuasive way to uh, understand and explain Wittgenstein's use of form of life is via Stanley Cavell's methodology, uh, which um, seems to be some sort of hybrid position between naturalism and monism. With this in mind, given that Wittgenstein uh, tends to emphasize particularities there is this kind of thematic question of, are there any hidden universals within the particularities of form of life? Uh, and uh, Stanley Cavell would definitely say that there are some underpinning notions of such uh, uh, unity. So uh, regarding Wittgenstein's metaphilosophy, uh, there are some, some uh, majority views such as uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy can be merely read as therapeutic for us to be able to let the fly out of the fly bottle, for example. Uh, since we know we will not engage on a lot of topics uh, in, uh, in kind of an agreement way, and perhaps we shall uh, not ever agree since there might not be right answer to some philosophical questions, philosophy can only aid our ability to interact with ourselves and the external world. Uh, here you could also perhaps defer to J.L. Austin's uh, uh, paper, A Plea for Excuses. On the other hand, naturalists would take the stance that philosophical problems, be it in the space of metaphysics or elsewhere, are indeed real, hence solvable. So it's not mere speculation or some sort of conceptual proliferation in that sense to expand our scheme of beliefs and so forth. Philosophy as an active practice cannot be spoon-fed. One must arrive at their own particular conclusive remarks in light of linguistic investigation towards the application of concepts. Uh, I'm going to argue that Wittgenstein did indeed make positive claims. He did make arguments and they weren't mere methodical claims in that sense. Uh, at least for the introductory aspect of it, uh, I found Floyd's uh, work quite persuasive as far as understanding some of the fundamental notions of, of a form of life. So her emphasis, at least in, in one of the articles in Nordic Wittgenstein Review, seems to be emphasizing ideas of aspect and technique, which are salient for approximating how Wittgenstein himself might have conceived of this notion. The difference to language games as objects of analogous reasoning is also echoed in philosophical investigation, where Wittgenstein alludes at common properties of games and languages themselves. Understanding languages as dynamic expressions of human life and linguistic practices is a helpful investigative tool 
towards the relationship of forms of life as well. And philosophical investigation we see here, I mean, the, the Wittgenstein's exposure of form of life or forms of life or what have you appears very rarely throughout all of his mature writings. Uh, there. And uh, one of them here is that the word language game is used here to emphasize the fact that speaking of language as part of an activity or a form of life. This also seems to be one of the most uh, interesting ways in which Wittgenstein discusses form of life because it has led to a diversity in the literature, whether or not this should be read as some sort of uh, anthropological notion or um, something biological. Floyd also emphasizes that we as humans are conceptually gifted creatures. The active engagement in utterances is a process of binding. It is an ongoing process of identifying the correct use of conceptual relations in such a way that we disambiguate our use of language. Uh, before I uh, kind of move on to really explain what the relativistic position really is in this debate, uh, I would like to open with uh, some sort of criticism towards the notional use of relativism itself. Uh, the idea of relativism here implies that there are hermetic walls between ideas. This cannot be achieved with the use of relativism. Wittgenstein himself must go beyond language games as the foundation of speech and grammar. Collective practices lead to uniform regularities over time, which are forwardly embedded in our form of life. This embedding process in turn structures our human life and shows us the combinatorial possibilities of thinking, binding, and conceiving in an interdependent manner. The clearest method for comparative analysis is an emphasis on the notion of interdependence rather than simply relational or its resembling cousin relativism. Relativism can still imply some sort of irreconcilable difference. Interdependence, on the other hand, is a notion that acknowledges differences and shows respect towards the understanding of plurality. Additionally, interdependence provides a conceptual contribution to a broader and holistic picture of the internal properties that link or connect ideas or practices. Collective practices lead to uniform regularities over time, which are forwardly embedded in our form of life. This embedding process in turn structures our human life and shows us the combinatorial possibilities of thinking, binding, and conceiving in an interdependent manner. Next, we have Hunter's uh, in, uh, four interpretations of the form of life. First, the form of life is a component of our human lives, a mediation tool throughout which systems of thought and behavior, however contingent they may be, are continuously animating human activities. Secondly, he says, every form of life is some sort of behavioral package directly associated with some sort of language game. Thirdly, a form of life is a building block of culture, be it in a religious or linguistic fashion. And lastly, a form of life is an organic or biological phenomenon that is inseparable from our human existence. The, la the last interpretation is what Hunter himself holds to be the case. Um, we should also perhaps make a distinction between transcendentalism and naturalism in an additional sense, because both monists and pluralists have their own divergences over this discussion. Transcendentalist uh, monists would hold that Wittgenstein's mystical rhetoric and analysis in some passages can lead us to conceive of a single form of life with some supernatural, or at least not subject to empirical investigation, properties and implications. Secondly, the naturalist would say that a form of life is a unitary aspect of our human experience. Different species have their own particular form of life, which is relative to their taxonomical classification. Our human form of life is shaped by our biological and evolutionary experience, alongside a recognizable pattern in our human natural history. Uh, kind of my imputation in this debate, it seems that the transcendentalists tend to defer to Kantian literature and the naturalists tend to defer to Humean literature. This is a general claim, not necessarily an all-encompassing claim. However, it does seem to me at least that this kind of debate of transcendentalism and natural in Wittgenstein has been taken as an additional opportunity for Humeans and Kantians to find uh, additional justifications for their own positions prior to reading Wittgenstein in the first place. As for pluralism, I defer to Honio Glock's uh, distinction. Firstly, there are the extreme pluralists. There are different, indefinitely many forms of life and the same can be said about language games. Every language game has its own form of life. This position uh, is not particularly common in contemporary literature. Uh, this presentation is primarily going to focus on the latter one, which is the moderate pluralists, which say that there is more than one human form of life. There are also less forms of life than language games. Each culture has its own form of life in addition to however many language games are contained within that particular culture. As far as transcendental monism, I'll primarily look at Baker first. So Baker necessitates some sort of transcendence, the primary observation akin to a position of epistemic idealism. We cannot ostensibly teach the form of life. They are mind-dependent notions. 
there is nothing in the external world which can be point which we can point to for the purpose of engaging in a meaningful discussion about the form of life the same cannot be said about colors or animals for example the second observation addresses an asymmetry between the practice of language and the entities to which they refer Baker says, uh, although the use of concepts of independently existing objects depends on practice, it does not follow that the things to which the concepts apply likewise depend on practice. The fact that the existence of human concepts can be somewhat generally equated with the existence of a great variety of human linguistic practices, and then uh, she kind of uh, turns towards this view that there, there must be some sort of uh, innate unity of apprehension similar to how Kant uh, per he perceives grammar that kind of binds uh, contradictory uh, positions in our own mind and hence we must defer to some sort of transcendental explanation. Lear, on the other hand, says that given the manifold of perceptions that the human mind can experience in addition to the plurality of divergent views that accompany such a manifold, there must be an eye consciousness which synthesizes the plurality of representations and their respective content. Additionally, Lear argues that the inner grasping of a rule is different from the outer or behavioral one and the unity of apprehension is connecting these remarks. And, uh, the, the, this is supposed to show some sort of unity of diversity yet uh, uh, some sort of logical necessity for them uh, holding uh, for the mind uh, having to hold some sort of monistic uh, framework of perceiving and conceiving in order to actually make sense of the use of all these concepts in our belief schema. So my response to the transcendental monists is that first of all regarding Baker's piece it seems that uh, she uh, she later on kind of turns around her own argument and she says, well, forms of life actually has no, have no explanatory value whatsoever. But throughout the paper, it seemed that she was making positive arguments as to what, it, what a form of life really means. So in that sense, it, it seems like a, a contradictory standard. Uh, secondly, the mind-dependent argument does not show any sort of metaphysical necessity for transcendence. We can have uh, mainly her explanation without some sort of uh, process of deferring to uh, Kantian notion of transcendence. And also, I would like to defend Glock's response, as, and this applies to all sorts of transcendental positions as far as uh, Wittgenstein's reading of form of life is concerned, which is that he provides two reasons that distinguish Wittgenstein from Chomsky's linguistic paradigm and other evolutionary psychologists. Firstly, we cannot understand linguistic practices through our reference only to neurolinguistic phenomena. And secondly, language is a communal activity, hence any description that does not include social formations is incomplete and insufficient. Next, I am going to look at Newton Garver's position. Uh, he is actually quite difficult to categorize in that sense, but it would likely also be unfair to say that Garver was not fond of categories given that he was a trained Kantian scholar, uh, but he tends to kind of merge interesting positions together and hold some sort of view that is naturalistic. However, he does defer to Kant to explain some empirical phenomena, so it is nonetheless questionable what exactly was Garber's position. With these things in mind, nonetheless, Gar uh, Garber says, Wittgenstein's naturalism is, however, Richard and Strassen's, because his natural history of human comprises grammar, language games, and our complicated form of life. These human activities involve norms. Some sort of norms of language are arbitrary, and this naturalism, therefore, contains the seeds of normativity and of certain sorts of transcendence of the merely empirical and merely factual. Secondly, the view that our human form of life encapsulates our activities, beliefs, and so forth is compatible with the anthropological reading that a form of life also has cultural implications. These are likely some of the, the major takeaways that we should have from Garver. Firstly, human activities involve the presence of norms. This observation shall be further expanded on. And secondly, the human form of life encompasses the natural history of humanity, which also tends to be quite uh, uncontroversial as far as perhaps all possible positions on form of life are concerned. With this in mind, however, I would also like to point out that there is no such thing as an inflexible biological notion. Natural selection occurs because our biological aggregates are flexible and contingent. As a result, our human form of life is also temporally contingent to the global, social, political, and ecological system we choose to maintain as a human species. Uh, moving on to transcendental uh, pluralism. Uh, Gear uh, tends to show some sympathy towards Cavell's writing that there must be some sort of compatibility between the anthropological and biological. However, Gear decides that the pluralistic reading uh, 
is more persuasive, Gear also finds parallels with Kant's reasoning, specifically that Wittgenstein's forms of life seem to be similar to Kant's Bedigungen der Mogli, Moglichkeit der Erfahrung, which are the conditions for the possibility of existence. Williams also shares Gear's transcendental intuitions. However, he defers to a justification from the Tractatus, namely the, in, uh, the famous line that the limits of our language are the limits of our world. Moderate pluralism, on the other hand, tends to be uh, a quite popular view is also held by uh, Baker Hacker as well as Hanya Glock, which is that the pluralists operate under this presumption that every culture is a unique set of combinatorial possibilities of behaviors, beliefs, desires, and whatever else may constitute a culture. At the same time, Wittgenstein himself does not give a clear criteria for the foundation of culture, which is one of the criticisms that I have towards uh, an exaggerated emphasis on the cultural denotations of forms of life. Every language and in turn every culture borrows customs, utterances, and belief structures over time from their respective neighbors and other civilizations they have come in contact with. Cultures themselves have dependently originated during the vast natural history of humanity. And this notion of dependent origination is quite inspired uh, from uh, Buddhist philosophy. I did not directly uh, defer to it altogether, but I definitely felt that it was salient towards really understanding the idea that there, there is no such thing as this unique monolithic entity, this sort of Cartesian fortress of mind that, that is impenetrable or impermeable by other, form, by other uh, forms of human activities. However, the view that every culture has its own form of life does not entail some difficult implications. Firstly, it presumes that cultures are monolithic entities that can become more intelligible by placing them in contrast to other cultures. Although the later claim is reasonable insofar as it has the former presumption as an antecedent, the anthropological method defers to relativism over interdependence. Relativists alienate throughout the formation of their arguments. They create a discourse and debate culture where it is permissible to alienate universal human conduct and undervalue similarities under the guise of philosophical anthropology. Um, I'm also indeed aware that not all people that favor the position of this uh, cultural uh, relativism in Wittgenstein are Quineans, however, uh, they do have at least some minimal commitments to what Quine has to say about these sorts of uh, fuzzy anthropological pro projects, which is why this criticism should still uh, be interesting. So Cavill's justification is what I found most persuasive and I, and I would like to defend, which is that we can look at the human form of life without a deference to a transcendental explanation. Cavell's distinction of the biological denotation being the vertical sense and the ethnological denotation as the horizontal sense provides a good analogy for how these two paradigms can be compatible. They each have their own instrumental value. However, we understand them both not simply in distinction to each other, but also as a pair. A bird needs both of its wings to fly. A naturalist monist does not have to be re as restrictive as Hunter's organic account, nor as disposed to offer a compromise with the transcendental notion such as Carver's either. A monistic naturalistic reading of Wittgenstein does not necessitate a commitment to biological reductionism. Uh, secondly, uh, it seems that I have roughly 10 minutes, so I am not going to have the time to also cover the third aspect of religious epistemology. Feel free to, uh, to read the paper if you have any curiosities towards that, but I shall try to summarize as, as clearly as I can, and perhaps even on a slower pace, this view of autonomy of grammar and how I try to offer a complementary view to hackers. So, um, Hacker kind of makes this uh, this move that uh, some the norms of representation are not truth app, they're not about truthness or falsehood in, in, in a logical sense, but, but rather that uh, he says that there is no such thing as justifying grammar as correct by reference to reality. Grammar is not answerable to reality in the currency of truth. The rules of grammar have an arbitrary component, meaning that names themselves contain their meaning in virtue of the practice of a linguistic community. There is nothing inherent in the hue of red, nor any physical property of redness may have, which makes the English speaking community have to call it red. Reality does not provide a mechanism of correctness for grammar. There is nothing inherently necessary to our process of conceptual formation, as far as the designative process is concerned. The autonomy of grammar is not only an explanation for the process of the formation of conventions and a display of the bounds of a particular language game, but it also shows the overall, the functional properties of language itself. Hacker uh, extends this uh, uh, reading to also show some sort of empirical uh, 
uh, and utilitarian sort of view of what it really means to, to use language in the way in which we do. Uh, language is also constrained in a good way by physical and empirical limitations. We do not play chess with pieces heavier than we can lift, nor do we use notations which we cannot survey. These constraints are clearly an advantage to our linguistic practices. They show the utilitarian aspect of grammar and utterances. The bounds of sense are directly affected by uh, convenience, intelligibility, and use. The usefulness itself of a practice is determined by the practical constraints in which the sphere of activities is contained and performed. Uh, I find Hacker's explanation of the autonomy of grammar quite compelling, and uh, my ambition was to offer a complementary response to uh, his project, namely that Insofar as human agreement sustains grammar by practices of forming, maintaining, and eventually revising conventions, normative conduct too can follow a similar line of reasoning. Akin to how no physical property of redness tells us how to morphologically construct the designation for the hue, if there were such a thing as real moral objects, these objects would not be able to tell us anything about how to conceive them, nor how to construct conventions around them. Secondly, this consistency of our behavior, speech, and mental acts are the recurring activities in which we find the necessary uniformity to ascribe, describe, and prescribe linguistic rules. Hacker describes these regularities as an anthropological phenomena rooted in human behavior. Thirdly, I will argue that this normative component necessary for agreement in representations is a tool in the multiplicity of our language games, which function more than a mere semantic norm. Insofar as human agreement sustains grammar by practicing, forming and maintaining and eventually revising conventions, normative conduct too can follow a similar line of reasoning, akin to how no physical property of redness tells us how to morphologically construct the designation for a hue. Oh, I apologize, this, is, uh, th this was repeated. Okay, let's see. So let's go to uh, Wittgenstein's exegesis as to why I think not only the hacker was right in his uh, uh, format of describing the autonomy of grammar, but also perhaps offered a complementary explanation. So in the foundations of mathematics, uh, Wittgenstein states that it is of the greatest importance that a dispute hardly ever arises between people about whether the color of this object is the same as the color of that. The length of this rod, the same as the length of that, etc. This peaceful agreement is the characteristic surrounding of the use of the word same. Next, in culture and value, he states that the origin and the primitive form of the language game is a reaction. Only from this can the more complicated forms grow. Language, I want to say, is a refinement. In the beginning was the deed, which is likely also a reference to Goethe's uh, work Faust. Next, in philosophical investigation, he says that, how am I able to follow a rule? If this is not a question about causes, then it is about the justification for my acting in this way, in complying with the rule. And uh, I would really like to stress this if here, uh, because he doesn't completely exclude the discourse of causality per se, he just offers a potential alternative explanation in this sense. And I'm uh, going to attempt to explain why there might be some sort of interesting implications for perceiving such uh, normative rules of representation as a social effect. So, uh, uh, you know, philosophers tend to come up with their own kind of unique words. So as far as my contribution to this sort of grammatical project, insofar as it is clear, interesting, or persuasive, I uh, developed this notion of salva regula, which I would say it is a necessary norm of representation. We should visit Hacker briefly for a second. So Hacker says, having a length is an internal property of rods. If something lacks a length, it is not rod. And if a rod ceases to have a length, it will cease to be a rod. Similarly, internal relations are conceived to be essential to the identities of their relata. Red is darker than pink. If a color lighter than pink, it cannot be read. Necessary propositions, we have always been told, describe the essential features of the world. Every identity statement semantically entails its negation as well. The utterance of word red already includes a process of conceivability in which the agreement in representation also entails that what we mean by red is the exclusion of every other hue that is darker than red and every other hue that is brighter than it. <clears throat> 
the same of an object entails not only its properties, but also the linguistic bounds in which it is sensible and correct to use that particular name. The argument of salva regula shall be full, further elaborated as this necessity of normativity for the functional use of language. This surely has interesting modal implications for the use of language and the cognitive activity undergone by the brain when processing direct perception of hues, as well as the overall cognitive architecture supporting both linguistic production and interpretation. This little side note here was primarily intended to further be elaborated upon as to why naturalistic monism is also more persuasive from an empirical point of view when we look at modern psychology, when we look at people that are bilinguals or uh, poly, polylinguals to some, some great extent as how they still share some sort of fundamental human form of life when they undergo the transition from one language to another. So here is the formulation of Salva Regula. Firstly, all descriptive statements are meaningful. They do not have to be a correct representation in that sense, but they have to be at least meaningful in some sense. Secondly, all, all explanations too are meaningful since Wittgenstein in some obscure passages attempted to make a distinction between uh, description and explanation. Thirdly, descriptions and explanations make sense because of rules of representation, which is more or less uh, a summary of Hacker's view. Fourthly, the property of rules that make the first and the second premise possible meaningful is a norm. Two conclusions can be drawn from this. Firstly, all utterances have some, have some sort of normative property. And uh, secondly, therefore, all statements are normative. Here by normative, we do not necessarily have to entail normative in the sense of this must be the case or uh, some sort of the ontic view of it is uh, necessarily obligatory for such and such norm to be enacted or or be enforced to use a Glock's um, kind of view. However, it does mean that every utterance does carry some sort of normative aspect to it. The rules of a language game make complete sense to us because we have restricted bounds of options within the game. We have drawn these boundaries for a special purpose, the purpose of making sense to us as a linguistic community. We can understand chess correctly due to the finite rules that it has, as well as the finite options within the game itself. By constructing conventions around the game of chess, for example, which is also contingent, we restrict the options that are acceptable for a chess player to perform. These boundaries provide the, dy the dynamic modes of comparison both directly and internally to the rules themselves. We can compare on one hand the moves of the bishop with the movements of the queen. However, we can also internally compare what the pawn can do with what the pawn cannot do. These comparative standards are the outcome of the social effect created by our conventions and conceptual relations. And here I must stress this view was also at least indirectly inspired from Floyd's view of technique and aspect that we also use these not only as methods for constructing conventions themselves, but they also become operators inside the social games that we play. A reasonable explanation for such linguistic phenomena is a notion of social effect embedded in our form of life and scaffolded by the autonomy of grammar and interdependence with salva regula. And again, I stress interdependence and not relation. And uh, I believe that's time. Since I do have one minute, I would like to uh, skip to the conclusive remarks. So researchers that hold an atheistic paradigm are going to ascribe a humane framework to Wittgenstein and defer to naturalism in some form. In contrast, theists are going to commit to a transcendental Wittgenstein and find a Kantian justification to their use of form of life. If we have yet not yet noticed the meaninglessness in Wittgenstein's original use and the semantic plasticity which gave rise to this dilemma and their consequential implications, then we have been talking past each other for decades and we are going to continue doing so as well. If Wittgenstein had a clear intention to illustrate this notion as either transcendental or cultural, he would have done so. The efforts of Wittgenstein scholars to find the needle in the haystack and overinterpret the form of life as either cultural or transcendental necessitate the exegetical leaps and reasons which are not demanding of the primary literature. If the emphasis was not intended to be on our human form of life, Wittgenstein himself could have easily written form of culture or transcendental form of X, or X is the favorite externality of the interpreter. Okay, that uh, would be it from me. Thank you very much uh, for offering me the chance to speak with you.